Thank you so much, Chair, uh, distinguished delegates, Your Excellencies. It's a privilege for me to be here today. Uh, before we, before I have the privilege of introducing uh, Professor Jeffrey Sh uh, Sachs for this talk, uh, we're going to do a quick segue to a three-minute video on IFAD's work in climate adaptation. Thank you so much, sir. Two years ago, COVID-19 stopped the world in its tracks, cutting off millions of rural people from their markets and ruining their livelihoods. And through it all, small-scale farmers and producers continue to grapple with an even greater challenge, climate change. Across every continent and in every community, weather changes that result in erratic rainfall, extended drought periods, flooding and a rise in pests and diseases are hitting rural communities hard. Yeah, fossil. Hey, how are the land fossil? These guys are from Okar Borna. They are not from here. But these guys are from Kaitia. We are from Okar Borna. Antes, cuando éramos chiquitos, de plano que el tiempo no no es así. Ahorita que peor cuando llovió la vez pasada cayó mucho derrumbe. Through it all, Ifad has been on the ground in the most remote rural communities ensuring the impacted small-scale farmers and producers can adapt to these challenges. Our impact is often life-saving, but there's much more that needs to be done. Currently, just 1.7% of global climate finance is directed to help small-scale farmers in developing countries adapt to climate change. At EFAD, we're stepping up our efforts to change that. Over the next three years, 40% of our core resources will be dedicated to climate finance. We are scaling up partnerships to mobilize over 2 billion US dollars in climate funds by 2027. Our new climate fund, ASAP Plus, will channel more climate finance to small scale producers to help them adapt and become more resilient. We will build on the work we are already doing to provide innovative yet practical solutions across the globe. We're providing new technology to give early warnings about weather and tools to improve harvesting and processing reforesting mangroves and building new access routes, investing in drought-resistant seeds and new farming techniques to retain fertile soil, harnessing the world's natural resources to help rural people earn a living and opening up new opportunities for young people and women. Ahora con todo esto del cambio climático, las tierras ya, ya producen menos. Pero en hidroponía tenemos la gran ventaja. Every one of you here today plays a role in helping the most vulnerable rural people to access the financing and innovations they need to adapt and thrive. Together we can ensure recovery. Rebuilding Resilience. Distinguished delegates, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is a huge personal as well as a professional honor for me to be introducing Professor Jeffrey Sachs as our EFAD speaker today. As a development and environmental economist myself, Jeff's combination of scholarship and activism has influenced me deeply. Jeff, as you all know, is widely recognized for bold and effective strategies to address challenges, including debt crises, hyperinflation, transitions from central planning to market economies, the management of AIDS, malaria, and many other diseases, and has been intrepid in innovating so that developing countries and poor populations have the abilities to escape poverty while doing it within the context of planetary boundaries. But the privilege today is also personal. I worked with Jeff for almost four years while I was faculty at the Earth Institute and associate research scientist at Columbia University. 
The world had just been introduced to the MDGs and Jeff was instrumental in developing and informing and transforming us in that context. During my tenure there, we recognized collectively his personal passion for ensuring that development is inclusive and is led by people who are most affected while ensuring that he himself was accessible and open to scrutiny. I know Jeff to be one of the most indefatigable and personally principled human being who is fair and inspirational. I have had the privilege of knowing Jeff from far and from near. Jeff is one of the world's leading experts on economic development, global macroeconomics, and fight against poverty, and has advised more than 140 countries and dozens of world leaders in his role as special advisor to three United Nations Secretary Generals. Jeff currently serves as SDG advocate under Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez, while also being a university professor and director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. Jeff was twice named among Time Magazine's 100 most influential world leaders and has received 38 honorary doctorates. He's also received the Legion of Honor from France in 2021 and the Order of the Cross from Estonia in 2019. Ladies and gentlemen, without much further ado, it is my privilege to hand over this mic over to Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Jeff, the floor is yours. Joe, thank you. Thank you very much. So great to see you. Thank you for all the wonderful work that you do and the inspiration that you give to all of us and the guidance that you give to all of us technically uh, on how to understand what we're doing, measure what we're doing, evaluate what we're doing, and, and uh, keep on, on a proper course. And thank you to IFAD for all your leadership in some of the toughest places in the world, some of the poorest places in the world. The video that we just watched uh, in the lead into this session really uh, brought back lots of memories of site visits uh, to see IFAD's work uh, that I've seen personally all over the world. And it also reminds us that you are representing uh, people who are otherwise not heard on this planet uh, and people who are suffering tremendous uh, a tremendous harms that they had nothing to do with causing and that are not exactly natural harms. Uh, the climate change that we are living through now and that is threatening lives everywhere, but especially the lives of the poorest people and the smallholder farmers that you represent, is a known human-caused malady. Uh, we've been talking about this for uh, decades. Uh, in fact, the scientists first talked about global warming back in 1896. Uh, we have been negotiating about this since 1992, when the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was signed. We're still battling to get anything real accomplished in this world. Uh, we have not even leveled off high levels of emissions, much less turn them down, much less uh, uh, establish the trajectory to get to zero or negative, which we have to get to, in fact, for a safe planet. So you're doing heroic work, but I'd say that all development work these days is against the odds. It's against the odds because there is a lot of momentum of difficulty. The environmental crises are deeply built in. It's against the odds because the international economy does not address the needs of poor people. Uh, the international financial system does not direct capital to the poorest places in the world. Quite the contrary, it directs capital to the richest places in the world, which have access at the lowest cost, and of course, own the central banks that print the currencies uh, that are the global currencies, uh, which is not exactly a privilege that uh, poor countries uh, enjoy. And 
we're against the odds because, uh, frankly speaking, it, the rich countries, and I'll start with my own, the United States, basically lost sight of poor people in this world. Uh, and uh, we've been in a, uh, also, I would say about a 30-year decline of attention span uh, to realities in the world. And it's not a secret the United States can't govern itself anymore, much less uh, uh, providing uh, any kind of leadership for the world. So we're, we're in a very difficult time. And it will get worse unless we have uh, a concerted and collective change of direction. And we've seen in this pandemic, <laughs> we're not so good at it. Uh, this pandemic uh, has claimed if you do the math uh, more accurately than the reported data, uh, around 12 million lives. And we have not gotten our act together even to get vaccines to poor people, uh, which is not a heavy lift if we had the attention span to do it. But even when we know that immunizing all of the world is in our immediate self-interest to stop the spread of new variants and to bring this pandemic to a close, even with that self-interest, <laughs> we're not able to get organized for the moment. So I, I didn't really want to sugarcoat uh, the situation because uh, this is not uh, the kind of governance that we need. I think that the uh, international multilateral system of which EFAD is a proud leader is critical for our survival. And we need to raise the voice everywhere for mobilization of resources, because that's the bottom line for this, directing our uh, energies, our finance, our technologies to address these global challenges through a multilateral system. Instead, what we see every day is talk of war, conflict, geopolitics, internal divisions, rather than the mobilization that we need internationally. What could be done? Well, I, I think uh, I tend to view this issue uh, to uh, extend through the financial lens, because if one has the money, then so much else can follow. Uh, as the video showed us, there are huge numbers of innovative technologies. Uh, we're in an era where because of connectivity, because of the potential of digital access, because of the possibility of low-cost distributed electrification, technologies and solutions which seemed impossible even 5 or 10 or 15 years ago are ever present now. When uh, Joe and I uh, worked on uh, uh, projects for Millennium Development Goal progress in villages in rural Africa, there wasn't a phone available. There wasn't any electricity available. Uh, this was uh, 10 years ago. Now there can be complete digital access. There can be electrification everywhere but it requires a little bit of financing. Uh, but the financing is now the obstacle, not the technology, not the possibilities of making the kinds of basic breakthroughs that can transform lives and save people uh, and uh, implement uh, advances in, uh, in know-how. So we need to mobilize finance. And there is, I think, where the issues uh, can be faced head on and should be faced head on. Now, we're late to do it, but we should do it. Now, the G20 ministers, finance ministers are meeting uh, in Indonesia for this year's uh, G20. I think that this is a critical venue. Uh, so far, the finance ministers of the G20 really don't get it. Uh, they need to, but they don't quite understand how unfair, unjust, and inefficient the global financing is right now. After all, 
they did not mobilize even the $100 billion from all sources for all developing countries that was long promised for climate. And that was a promise made in 2009. And it was repeated every year up until uh, COP26. And they couldn't get their act together, even though they wrote their own report card of what they wanted to count towards climate finance. They couldn't even fake the numbers to get it up to $100 billion. This is a rather disgraceful uh, scene, given that in the context of COVID, they raised emergency financing for themselves of $17 trillion. But when it came to climate change, they couldn't mobilize, even with loans counted, $100 billion for the climate change agenda. So we need to raise our voices because we in the development community are on the front line. We see the world more fully than I'm afraid uh, the politicians of the rich countries who see their own uh, narrow world, but don't understand the reality of what's happening in, uh, in the entire world and the damages that the rich countries have caused the poor countries. So what to do with this G20, what to do with this financing? Well, first, unfortunately, the list of financing needs is, is long uh, because we need funding for climate change. We need uh, funding uh, even for ending this damn pandemic. We need to get the kids back in school. And even before COVID, there were about 260 million school-age kids who had no classroom, who had no place in school, even before, despite our promises for decades that it is a human right for everybody to have education, despite the Millennium Development Goal promises and now SDG 4 of universal access for free education from pre-K to upper secondary. So there's a crisis of financing education. There's a crisis of financing, as EFED knows very well, safe water and sanitation. So we need not to go after our one by one individual uh, priorities, but to create a framework for sustainable development that is commensurate with our challenge and commensurate with a world of $100 trillion per year output and a capacity to mobilize trillions of dollars if we put our minds to it. So in that context, I'm pushing and hoping and advocating that the G20 and the United Nations and the international system put forward a comprehensive financing framework that includes a number of components. First, on climate finance, the rich countries should be paying a carbon fee that should close the gap on the promised international financing. You know, if the rich countries each paid uh, something like four or five dollars per ton of CO2 emitted, a tiny fraction of the damages that they cost. This by itself would bring us the $100 billion a year. So carbon pricing and some revenues from that is absolutely basic, trivial, vital, and not aid for poor countries. It is the first step of a minimum of recognizing historic responsibility and some compensation for damages done. So I would start with raising carbon taxes from rich countries. And when EFAD talks about collecting $2 billion for smallholder farmers, frankly, it's too, too little. Uh, and 2027 is too late. And get in there and let's fight for something more because the damages are coming from the rich countries. This is not about aid and it's not about begging. 
It is about needs, historical responsibility, and basic justice. And it's not complicated. And two billion is too small to fight for. If you're going to fight, fight for 20 billion and let's get it done now because that's what's needed. And let's take the case internationally and also build on the powerful results of the UN Food System Summit last fall, which made the case that we have a global food sustainability emergency. And EFAD is in the front line of fighting that more knowledgeable on the ground than any other institution on helping smallholder farmers. So that's the first point. Second, we need a lot more financing through the multilateral development banks. The World Bank, the regional development banks, national development banks, as well, development finance institutions, These entities can tap capital markets at low cost and should be doing so on a vastly larger scale. We should be leveraging their balance sheets. And more loans is fine to developing countries because those loans are manageable if they are long term and at low interest rates. If the United States can borrow at 2% on a 30 year bond, Why are we pushing the poorest countries out to try to borrow a 10% on a five-year note? That's crazy. The third thing we need to do is fix the private capital market system, which is completely misguided. There isn't one low-income country in the world that has an investment-grade credit rating. In fact, of the 82 low income and lower middle income countries, 82, only three, India, Indonesia, and the Philippines have an investment grade credit rating. 79 do not. So how are we going to have the private capital markets fund development, which is the mantra of our time, if almost no developing countries in the low income and lower middle income category have investment grade credit ratings. Now I've studied how those credit ratings are made. They're a nonsense. They're completely without an analytical basis. Basically, if you're poor, you're punished in the ratings. It's quite simple. So somehow we've left to small teams at Moody's, S&P and Fitch decisions of life and death over half the world's population based on completely erroneous criteria. And I want the IMF to step forward and say, no, we need a forward-looking strategy, not one that says to countries, you're poor, so we give you a low credit rating, and not one based on crude indicators of what is debt sustainability. When if these countries had the access to financial capital, they could educate the kids, build infrastructure, and grow rapidly. Because a low-income country today with adequate finance can easily grow 8 to 10% a year based on digital connectivity, electrification, and building human capital. So this is the kind of forward-looking system we need. Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England, brought together in his Glasgow uh, Financial Alliance for Net Zero, GFANS, $130 trillion under management. Great. Terrific start. But none of it's going to flow to the poor countries unless we change the rules of the game. So this is another aspect that is absolutely essential. and then. We have the great initiatives like EFAD or the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria, or other special funds, the Global Environment Facility, and others. But these crucial organizations, also I'd add the CGIAR to this, live on (laughs) handouts, even though they're the lead institutions to solve global problems. 
So we need to understand that we can't have a world system that works if we are profoundly and chronic and chronically underfunding the core knowledge institutions that can help to make the breakthroughs. The UN core budget, $3 billion a year. You can compare that with New York City's annual budget, which is $100 billion a year. And we say that the UN core budget should be basically the budget of a neighborhood of New York City. So this is where we need to get straight, get the numbers right, make the clear agenda, and show that in a world of $100 trillion a year output, a world in which the richest nine Americans have $1 trillion of personal wealth, a world in which the Netherlands is going to dismantle a bridge in Rotterdam so that Jeffrey Bezos' super yacht can be taken out of the shipyard into the sea because it's too big to go through the bridge. What kind of world is this when we see the challenges that people all over the world are facing? So thank you, Ifad, for what you do. Please uh, count on me to help you raise the $20 billion, not the $2 billion. We need real money and we need it now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Sachs, for that interesting and challenging and at times depressing take on our global issues. My name is Joanne Leverton and I'll be moderating the Q&A part of this talk. I'd like to remind the distinguished representatives you have the opportunity to ask Professor Sachs some questions. Please raise your hands, keep it brief, and we'll try to get through as many as possible. Uh, just uh, to kick things off, I'm just going to start with the first question to you, Professor Sachs. You talk about a whole new financing framework that, that really would be a, a revolution. How do you think that will come about? And what is the role of organizations like EFAD in making that happen? I think it can come about by uh, having the world more clear about our needs, our common interests, and the current realities. We have to demystify uh, the economy. We have to help explain how rich the economy is, how rich the rich in the economy are, how poor the poor in this world are, how many challenges the poor are facing of problems that they have absolutely no authorship of and how there are solutions to these problems. I believe that the path to change is through demystifying the current situation, uh, absolutely being clear there, there is no invisible hand that's going to solve it. Uh, and uh, there is no invisible hand that has caused it. Uh, in fact, the uh, difficulties and the challenges have causes. We can identify them and we can identify the solutions. And I think a business-like approach, which says, here's what we need to do and here's how much it costs and here's how it can be organized, is the basic correct response to uh, these issues. It's not easy. Uh, the politicians have an incredible capacity <coughs> to look the other way, no doubt. Shame is not one of their great uh, <laughs> attributes. Uh, Self-agony uh, is, uh, is not. I'm living in a country that is absolutely capable of neglecting the most basic truths. But still, I don't see another way uh, other than making the facts clearly known uh, and then in these processes where uh, we have leaders working, putting this clearly on the agenda. We have a world of 8 billion people, and I would say, basically speaking, the bottom 4 billion people in this world are deeply struggling right now, and the system is not addressing their needs. Thank you. Well, we have uh, a number of uh, representatives of, from around the world uh, listening to this. Um, interesting to hear, interested to hear what questions they have for you. 
Let's first go to the Dominican Republic. Please remember to unmute. Uh, muchas gracias. Eh, voy, como he tomado la, las notas de la presentación del profesor Sachs en inglés, voy a formular la pregunta que tengo para él en ese, en ese idioma. Uh, Professor Sachs, uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we met already at FAO when I posed a question to you. Now, you have uh, put the ball, so to speak, on the court of the richest countries, the G20 you mentioned, and uh, the most developed countries among those. You also referred to uh, the zero growth for the core budgets of uh, all UN agencies. And uh, this is something that uh, strikes uh, uh, developing country representatives uh, very harshly because uh, it's not a matter of money, because extra budgetary resources are flowing. And so uh, it may seem that uh, some countries would want IFAR and other agencies to become uh, sort of uh, subcontractors for uh, their um, uh, cooperation agencies. Uh, now, uh, my question would be, what can uh, countries in the middle and upper middle <laughs> income levels uh, do about this situation? You present solutions for uh, action by developed countries, but what about countries, for instance, in Latin America and the Caribbean, countries uh, that are in that uh, wrong and um, uh, when some members of this governing council, uh, they haven't said so yet, but uh, I have heard them at the executive board and in previous governing councils uh, uh, saying that, uh, 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 barefaced, that uh, the IFAD should only take care of the poorest of the poor, contrary to the mandate of the institution. And so uh, that would mean setting aside middle and upper middle income countries as if uh, we had resolved our problems in rural poverty and malnutrition and hunger and so on, uh, which is of course not true. Uh, so what, what can developing countries do if developed countries um, uh, acquiesce to your suggestion? Uh, we have little absorption capacity uh, and, and we have um, a little uh, uh, local capacities for uh, dealing with uh, renewed influxes of uh, financial resources. That's my question to you, sir. Thank you. Great. Th thank you very much. Good to see you. Uh, you know, I, I think there are a number of uh, points that I would quickly mention. First, uh, there's a strong case for regional cooperation. So uh, in the Caribbean, for example, so many common problems and common challenges uh, and uh, I would urge strongly in every region of the world, getting together, uh, by the way, across uh, local uh, rivalries and animosities and historical uh, problems to say we are stuck together uh, in the Caribbean uh, in uh, increasing storm environment, uh, in increasing climate instability and, and vulnerability and so forth. That's true of every part of the world. There are important regional inst uh, institutions uh, in, in uh, Latin America, of course, uh, the Inter-American Development Bank, the COF, uh, the Caribbean Development Bank. These need to be mobilized uh, as well. Uh, and so regional uh, development finance, I think, uh, is extremely important. Of course, uh, to be able to tap resources through those institutions, we need different rules of the game, and we need to start with the recognition that the flows of financing through the development finance institutions is probably a fifth to a tenth of what it ought to be. And then, as you pointed out, the startlingly small core budgets of crucial institutions like EFAD make absolutely no sense. And the truth is, if the United States, if the United States uh, in, in its uh, Gov 150 account budget brought a few billion dollars more of appropriations that would help to give proper financing, <laughs> it wouldn't even be noticed. It would be a, a footnote in our budgets. Uh, and this is uh, truly what the U.S. administration ought to be doing right now. Uh, instead, what it does is uh, to 
every part of the world say, don't ask us for money, don't ask us for money. Uh, and in the meantime, voted $7 trillion of emergency financing for its own account, and then said to the rest of the world, don't ask us anything. Well, you know, th the world can't work that way. <laughs> We're, we just can't function that way. So I think we need to have the voices of countries uh, like the DR get together to say, look, okay, we, we've tried your way for a long time. Uh, we've tried the, the way of the United States for 30 years of declining development finance, turning it over to the private markets. It's not working. It is absolutely time for something different. We are in an age of sustainable development. We need to finance our way out of this. And that, I think, is the, the core message. And then maybe some people will get to work. Use the multilateral fora because that's where the voices uh, are most represented in the General Assembly, on the boards of uh, the key multilateral institutions, in the EFAD Governing Council. Make it clear, make the rich countries carry the message back home that they can't get away with this kind of neglect anymore. Thank you. Just a reminder that uh, distinguished representatives, you have the opportunity to ask questions. Please raise your hands. In the meantime, let me just ask you, Professor Sachs, we, I mean, it's one thing to mobilize the funds, but should that funding be mobilized? What's the next step? What is the priority of what that money should be spent on? Where should it go? I think the sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement and the Convention on Biological Diversity give us the uh, basics. We need, uh, in my count, six basic areas of focus. I call them the six big transformations. One is on education, making sure that every child has a good education. This is the single most important investment for any society by far. The second is a proper health system something that we have seen during this pandemic is vital and unfortunately is either chronically underfinanced or uh, public health is sacrificed to private commercial uh, health care, uh, but uh, universal health coverage in a basic primary health system is second. Third is the energy transition, uh, and that means uh, electrification for all, through zero carbon energy. And uh, thankfully we have the technologies and the costs keep coming down, but they have upfront financing uh, costs. Fourth is sustainable food and land use, your department. Uh, and uh, there we know the interventions that are needed for upgrading basic technologies of smallholders, some key mechanization, integrating digital technologies, integrating uh, rural electrification for uh, fertigation and other uh, basic needs, improved varieties and so forth. The fifth is urban infrastructure uh, because cities need uh, decent housing, transport, connectivity, electrification, water, sewerage. And the sixth is digital transformation with access for all because we have a powerful tool for development with digital technology. We can use it for education. We can use it for healthcare. We can use it for technical advising. We can use it for infrastructure management. We can use it for decarbonization, but it only reaches half the world right now. And so I would say that the digital transformation is the sixth area. Well, you can put a price tag on all of those uh, we probably need incrementally for the developing world one to two trillion dollars a year. That's not so much with global saving on the order of about twenty five trillion dollars a year. So we need to shift a few percent of global saving to the developing countries. And then we need institutions like EFAD and your partners, FAO or WFP or WHO or UNESCO or UNIDO, we need those institutions, which we have set up exactly for this purpose, to play a frontline role in 
helping to mobilize the expertise, do the training, do the oversight, do the monitoring and evaluation, so that when the flows flow, they are being used well. And it's possible to do this because there are communities of expertise in each of these areas. There's expertise in smallholder farming. There's expertise in integrated pest management. There's expertise in climate adaptation. There's expertise in rural electrification. We need to bring these communities of expertise to the forefront and let them do their job. Thank you. I see there's a question from Malaysia. Please, please unmute. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, Professor Sachs. First of all, sir, thank you very much for your very enlightening uh, talk, and, and we always enjoy listening to your very, I would say, advanced and critical views. Uh, my question to you is simple. Uh, what would your message be to the, to the G20 finance ministers currently meeting in Indonesia on what would be the immediate reaction, of course, uh, uh, or immediate concerns they need to address and to ensure that the outcome that comes out of this, uh, of this uh, meeting uh, assists us in, in trying to at least address some of the key issues that you brought up today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would like them to say we are at work on a program of sustainable finance at the scale of the challenges that the world faces. First, to end the pandemic. Second, to make the energy transformation. Third, to make the sustainable land use transformation. Fourth, to get our children back in school all over the world, hundreds of millions of kids and those that never were in school into school. And that we are working on a financing framework, multi-part, to get this done. And that we know it is not getting done now. That's what I would like to hear them say. I'd like to hear them acknowledge the need and, and, and their, their work program. So I would like them to take, uh, take on their homework assignment, which is what I regard this uh, as being. If they do that and get down to work, then they will see in all the areas that I mentioned, reforming uh, the uh, credit rating system, expanding the balance sheets of the multilateral development banks, properly funding the multilateral special funds and international system, raising carbon taxes for global, uh, global uh, uh, climate uh, financing. All of those things will be on the agenda in the end. But I want them to check the boxes to say, for these major transformations that we have promised, we are working on a strategy. We, as leaders of the largest countries in the world, and as the finance officials of the largest countries in the world understand that it's our responsibility to help shift finance to the investments needed for a healthy planet. Thank you so much. Um, I see a question from Nigeria. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Professor Sachs. Very reassuring when one listens to your analysis, which is usually deep and constructive. Let me start from the beginning. I think sometime either last year, we had a meeting like this, and you spoke on one simple but profound change that could come if done. You are talking of having not only G20, but G20 plus one. What has happened to that suggestion since then? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, bringing that up. Here is the situation. We have uh, 19 countries in the G20, plus the European Union, representing the 27. So I said, well, if the European Union is in there, it is really natural 
that the African Union should be in there. After all, the African Union has more than three times the population of the European Union. The African Union is 54 nations. The African Union is crucial for the world's success. And the African Union has a profound stake in the reform of the international financial system. So I noted that with just one seat held by the chairperson of the African Union this year, Senegal President Macky Sall, we would bring 1.4 billion people to the discussion. We would bring the low income world to the discussion. We would bring $3 trillion of output to the discussion. So frankly, when I said it, I thought that's obvious. I thought it would happen the next moment. <laughs> but you know, we're still not quite there yet because I don't think the rich countries want to talk to the rest of the world so straightforwardly necessarily. But I would like us to see that this is a most basic point for success. Because if we're going to have an integrated world, we need a forum that is 20 rather than 193. The G20 really plays a useful role. I like it. You can have a tour of the table in about three hours and get a lot of good work done. And that is extremely valuable. So is the UN General Assembly, but it takes three weeks to have a tour of the table. So I like the G20 framework, but let's bring the African Union to the table. And then we have Af Africa right now is represented only by South Africa. And that just isn't sufficient for a continent of 54 countries and 1.4 billion people. So I'm still counting on it. I'm not relenting on my voice, but it hasn't happened yet. Uh, and I hope that the suggestion continues to be propagated. I'm certainly going to continue to advocate for it. Thank you. I believe Nigeria wants to have a follow-up question to that. Yes, 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 thank you. For today, I also want to sound it. The developed world, the resources are there, the monies are there, but something has, on, been, something has not changed. Hello. And that is, we want a situation where national governments also will be more prepared to see to the well-being of their people by making resources go to the fundamental things. Mm -hmm. I recall as a child, it was the period of smallpox. It was mandatory that every child must be in school and that gave us access to vaccination. I want to know your views about what can be done to alert national governments to these fundamentals before the additional ones were done. Thank you. It is in the Sustainable Development Goals, SDG number four, of course, says universal completion up through upper secondary of free public education. It's right there. And by the way, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, education was recognized as a basic human right, not just as a nice thing, but as a basic human right. Alas, there is a practical problem. In addition to some countries not trying hard enough, I know many countries where governments would love to implement universal education, but simply don't have the budget. Uh, an African finance minister said to me recently when I discussed the topic, Mr. Sachs, you talk about upper secondary 
we don't even have a budget for primary education that's sufficient. And I went back and I looked at the budget of uh, the gentleman's country. And sure enough, the revenues that are raised can't even cover the primary education. But that's because the country is extremely impoverished. And when you look at the impoverishment of the country, I have to tell you the abuses of the Western world in that country were extraordinary. And so this is not also just a, you know, a fate of history. This is one of the most abused places in the whole world with the looting continuing till today by international mining companies that don't pay their taxes, that pay bribes, that are absolutely a nefarious force, as is true in many places. So we have, again, a financing issue that even if a government wants to get the kids in school, it simply doesn't have the money for teachers, schools, electricity, running water, the basics. And that I, I've watched that issue for 20 years. For some reason, I can guess, but the rich countries just refuse to have an honest discussion about this. And the poor countries have the kids not in school. And by the way, any society where the kids are not in school is doomed. I'm sorry to say it, doomed. There's no future without education in this world. This should be absolutely the highest single priority of any country. Oh my God, how can we leave our kids without the skills they need to navigate their lives? You can't. And so this should be global priority. But what's, when's the last time one heard a global debate about financing education? <laughs> Almost never. It's shocking. We don't have a global education fund. We don't have the most basic mechanisms. UNESCO doesn't have finance for this. UNICEF doesn't have finance for this. And so we have hundreds of millions of kids out of school. And then we wonder what's wrong with their countries. Well, how could there be a future with that? So this is a very basic point. And again, I say to the finance ministers, do your job. Look at this. Understand this and face it and come up with a solution. Thank you so much. We're going to have to end it there. Thank you so much, Professor Sachs. And the purpose of the IFAD talk is really to challenge our thinking, and you've certainly done that. Great. Um, you know, you started off by saying all development is against the odds, um, but I appreciate how you've really recognized the importance of what IFAD does and the role that IFAD is playing uh, in trying to address some of these global challenges. you calling for a real overhaul of the financial system and uh, recognizing how much is required to really to take, take the world on a sustainable path. And uh, may many governments be listening to that. So I'd like to yeah. say thank you very much to Professor Sachs. Um, we're going to have to end it there. Is there an opportunity to take one more question or not? No, I'm afraid not. Sorry? Sorry, I see that there before we, I was just wrapping that up, but I see Cote d'Ivoire has raised a hand and we do have a few more minutes for another question. So before I close okay. things off, Cote d'Ivoire, you have the floor. Hello? Yes. Vous m'entendez? Est-ce que vous m'entendez? Yes, oui, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur. Vous m'entendez? Ok. Merci, merci de me donner la parole. Je voudrais ici souligner un fait qui est extrêmement important puisque on parle aussi de, de finances. Et l'année passée, le G20 a décidé en août 2021, un droit de tirage spécial de 650 milliards de dollars, euh, qui lui a fait mis, évidemment, qui est le plus élevé dans l'histoire de l'organisation. Et dans tout cela, parce que les défis que vous avez énumérés ici, c'est-à-dire l'éducation, la santé, le numérique, 
l'agriculture, l'alimentation, l'Afrique, 18 milliards de dollars iront à l'Afrique. Et vous avez, si vous avez dit 54 États, donc à imaginer tous ces défis que vous avez énumérés, comment est-ce que l'Afrique peut s'en sortir avec euh, ces ce 18 milliards de dollars Et c'est la question que je me suis posée. Et donc, euh, je voudrais entendre votre point de vue par rapport aux 650 milliards qui ont été dégagés et l'Afrique ne recevra que 18 milliards de dollars. Voilà. Thank you. I, I, I think you were referring to the special drawing rights allocation uh, made uh, by uh, the IMF, uh, which was a, a good and important development. The sustainable, the special drawing rights, SDRs, are a kind of a foreign exchange reserve uh, that is uh, allocated on a systematic global scale. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, African countries receive a small proportion of the total amount of reserves. It, it is uh, money that is used like any kind of foreign exchange reserve at the central bank for uh, general uh, emergency access to financing, for balance of payments support, for monetary operations. It's not really a mechanism for long-term finance. There was uh, an idea, there is an idea that some of these reserves received by the high income countries could somehow be recycled to provide some longer term finance for developing countries. There's a modest step that can be taken in that direction. But that 650 billion is mainly short term financing, mainly liquidity, and not really a solution to the longer term financing challenges that we've been discussing this past hour. For that, we're going to need the kinds of mechanisms that I've been describing, unlocking private capital by a different kind of uh, rating system that is forward looking, not backward looking, by changes of the way that the development banks operate by a, a new global carbon levy to finance climate. In other words, by mechanisms specifically designed for long-term development finance. Thank you, Professor Sachs. And that was a good sum up of some of the main points you've been making. Uh, so thank you for giving your own summary as well. Um, and so we're going to end it there. Thank you so much. And before I hand back to you, Chair, here is a short message from IFAD's youth advocate, Cherry Silver. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Sherry Silver. As IFAD's advocate for rural youths, I have seen firsthand the impact of climate change on young people. Many are the first to lose their jobs and to leave home when extreme weather events like prolonged drought, flooding or sea levels rising devastate their homes and communities. It's happening now and will happen again tomorrow and the day after that without your commitment. We need decisive action. Today's youth will bear the costs of climate change throughout their lifetimes. Their future success and happiness and their ability to earn a living and to feed their families will depend on targeted policies and investments that reduce the barriers they face each day. Barriers to education and technology, to healthcare and infrastructure, and to the finance that will ensure their capacity to adapt to a changing climate. IFAD has been a lender and investing in resilience for small scale farmers, but we have to do more. Together, we can make the changes that are needed to build a better future and a better climate for our rural youths. Together, we can do it. Thank you.